with a focus on hands-on code demos in Python to give you a working understanding of what's going on, this video illustrates the relationship between determinants and eigenvalues. All right, it may surprise you to learn this surprisingly simple relationship between determinants and eigenvalues. So simply put, the determinant of some matrix X is equal to the product of all of the eigenvalues of X. Let's jump to a hands-on code demo to have a look at that. All right, we saw in the preceding video that the determinant of this three by three matrix X is equal to 20. So now um, that's one side of the equation I just showed you. The other side is um, to confirm that this 20 is the same number we get if we calculate the eigenvalues of our matrix X. In this case, I'm using the eig method to do that. And then we calculate the product of all of the lambdas um, together. So multiplying each of these three values um, by each other. And we can do that with the numpy product method. And voila, it does turn out negative three roughly <laughs> times negative one roughly times five and a bit comes out to 20. All right, so to help you develop a geometric intuition around why this relationship between determinants and eigenvalues exists, let's cover a bit more theory on the slides and then we'll jump back to another hands-on code demo. So the absolute value of the determinant of X quantifies the volume change as a result of applying X to some tensor. So if the determinant of X is equal to zero, not only does this mean that the matrix X is singular and can't be inverted, but this also has a special impact on the tensors that we apply X to because X then collapses the space completely in at least one dimension of the tensor that we apply X to, thereby eliminating all volume of the tensor that we've applied X to. Following on from that, if the absolute value of the determinant of zero is somewhere between zero and one, then X will contract the volume to some extent of the tensor that it's applied to. So if the value here is 0.5, then X will have the impact of having the volume of the tensor that we apply X to. If the absolute value of the determinant of X is equal to one, then X will preserve the volume of the tensor that we apply X to exactly. And finally, and perhaps unsurprisingly, given um, the trend so far, if the absolute value of the determinant of X is greater than one, then X expands the volume of the tensor we apply X to. All right, if that didn't quite make sense, if you couldn't picture that in your head, don't worry about it. We'll use a hands-on code demo now to see all of this happening. All right, so back in our Linear Algebra 2 notebook in the determinants and eigenvalues section, here's the um, absolute value of the determinant of X in NumPy. So we just pass X into that determinant function and then we can use the NumPy abs method to calculate the absolute value. Now, of course, when we have 20 going in, a positive value is just gonna come out as a positive through absolute values, but if it had been negative 20, then it also would have come out as positive 20. And so what this means is that applying this uh, matrix X will have the impact of increasing the volume of the tensor we apply it to by 20. Let's break this down even more. Let's use a matrix B, which is composed of basis vectors to explore the impact of applying matrices with varying absolute values of determinant of X values. <laughs> that was a mouthful. I just, we're gonna play around with different kinds of matrices that have uh, varying um, absolute values of their determinants of X. And 
we will see how that impacts our matrix B, which is composed of basis vectors. So uh, it actually looks identical. It is identical to an identity matrix. Um, but here are the two basis vectors. So we have one basis vector running along the x-axis to this point where uh, x is equal to 1 and y is equal to 0. And then the other basis vector runs from the point where y is equal to 1 and x is equal to 0. So that's what the two columns here represent. And recall that basis vectors are not only orthogonal to each other, but they also have unit norm, an L2 norm of 1. And this means that they are orthonormal as well. So just a bit of a theory refresh there. So these basis vectors, because they're easy to remember what their shape is like, um, it's going to be easy to see um, how applying various matrices to these basis vectors impacts the basis vectors and how it impacts the volume that they represent. So you can imagine tracing a rectangle in this space that these vectors um, point out. So um, you can imagine that there was another point here rounding out the rectangle, which in this case would be a square. And that would mean that these two basis vectors describe a square with an area of one unit squared. Let's see how that volume changes as we apply various matrices to our basis vectors. Let's start off by applying the matrix N to our basis vectors. We're calling from earlier that the matrix N is singular. So it's singular because the columns are not independent. This column is a multiple of the right column. So if we were to multiply the right column by negative four, we would get um, the left column, which means that we have parallel lines and therefore n cannot be inverted. And it means that the determinant of n must be zero. So when the determinant of a matrix is zero, as I mentioned on the slides, this means that it must collapse uh, the tensor that it's applied to in at least one dimension, getting rid of its volume. So let's see that happen. Let's apply n to b. And that gives us this result. Let's have a look at it. Aha, uh -huh. so uh, in went our basis vectors and out came this perfectly flat uh, line. So these vectors are exactly opposite to each other. And that means that there's no longer any volume described by the vectors. So when they were basis vectors, we had one unit squared, but after applying the matrix N to them, they've been squished and we now have, um, yeah, just a, a straight line that has no volume. So let's calculate the eigenvalues. And we see that the eigenvalues of N, there's an eigenvalue of zero in there. And so voila, there's the relationship between our eigenvalues and our determinants. If any one of a matrix's eigenvalues is a zero, then the product, of course, of all of the eigenvalues must be zero. If one thing is zero in a bunch of things that we multiply by each other, the end result is going to be zero every time. And since we know that the a uh, determinant of a matrix is equal to the product of all the eigenvalues. If the product of all the eigenvalues is zero, the determinant must also be zero. There is an embodiment of this relationship here. So we're starting to see why geometrically this relationship happens. All right, for a further example, now let's try applying the identity matrix I2 to our uh, basis vectors. So the identity matrix happens to be identical um, to the basis vector matrix, but uh, no matter. Um, the determinant of I2 is one. One times one minus zero times zero is one. And when we apply I to B, we of course get back B, <laughs> which is the same as I. 
And so now when we plot how um, our basis vectors have changed, well, they haven't at all. Of course they haven't. We applied an identity matrix to them. Um, and so this is a, yeah, a bit of a boring example, but it goes to show how in a situation where our eigenvalues are both ones, then one times one is equal to one, and the product of the eigenvalues is equal to the determinant. The product of the eigenvalues is equal to the determinant. And therefore, the, um, the vectors retain the same uh, volumes that they described as before. So they described one unit squared, and after applying a matrix with a determinant of one, eigenvalues of all one, uh, we retain one unit squared described by those basis vectors. All right, so I admit that applying an identity matrix isn't the most exciting operation in the world. So let's now apply this matrix to J, which is a bit more interesting. So it has more going on than the identity matrix. It looks like this. Um, but negative 0.5 times 2 minus 0 times 0 comes out to negative 1. And the absolute value of negative 1, so the absolute value of the matrix J's determinant, is 1. Now let's apply J to B and observe how even though the matrix J does transform the basis vectors B, so it um, reflects and scales by half the blue basis vector, and it um, scales by two the uh, green basis vector. And so we also see here that the, uh, the basis vectors are in fact both eigenvectors of the matrix J, right? They remained on their spans. And given that they remained on their spans, they must be the two eigenvectors of the matrix J. And given that, it should come as no surprise that the eigenvalues of our two eigenvectors here are negative 0.5 and 2, because for this um, light blue vector, which it turns out must be the first eigenvector, when we multiply it by negative 0.5, it is transformed like this. And our green eigenvector, our second eigenvector, it gets multiplied by the eigenvalue of 2, so it becomes twice as long, but maintains its direction. And so even though the shape of the rectangle described by these two vectors is now definitely different, it's still one unit squared. So negative uh, 0.5 units times two units comes out to an area of one unit squared. So um, these eigenvalues correspond to a determinant, an absolute value of the determinant of one because they retain the volume described by the vectors. Hopefully it's starting to come together now. And finally, let's apply the matrix D, which scales vectors by doubling along both the X and Y axes. So D is simply, um, we can get it by um, multiplying our identity matrix by two. So it has um, this structure here, and the determinant of that matrix D is four. When we apply the matrix D to our basis vectors, um, those vectors are scaled by double along both the X and the Y axis. And let's see what that looks like in a plot. Well, voila. The basis vectors have both doubled in length. And we see that with our eigenvalues, because again here, both of these basis vectors are the eigenvectors of our matrix D. 
we know that because after we apply the matrix D, they both remain on their span. And yeah, so the eigenvalues for both of them are two, they both double, and the area described by these vectors now is four units squared. Two units times two units is a total of four units squared. All right, we've nearly wrapped up our tour of determinants and eigenvalues. Up next is the only remaining new eigenvector-related theory in which we formally study how a matrix can be wholly decomposed into eigenvectors and eigenvalues. To be sure not to miss the next tutorial in this series, subscribe to my channel. Thanks for taking part in the tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like and comment. To be sure not to miss any of my content, head to johncrone.com and sign up for my email newsletter. You're also welcome to add me on LinkedIn. Simply mention that you're a viewer of the Machine Learning Foundation series. You can follow me on Twitter too, if that's your social medium of choice. See you next time.